hey there welcome to saws group live ama again uh sorry guys you're stuck with me on a valentine's day but <laughs> we're talking today about navigating talent acquisition hiring top talent embracing remote and enabling growth and with me today are katarina ceo of diva a global talent network that offers companies a direct line to some of the world's Best talent, really happy to see you here. And uh, Ferry, our own uh, lead recruiting partner at uh, SaaS Group. Again, very, very happy that you're here. Thank you for making the time. And know how busy you guys are. We were just talking about this, how many applications you get <laughs> per an open position. So uh, let's dive into it. And uh, maybe let's start with a bit of introduction. So Katerina, will you do the honors? Uh, sure. So, hello everyone. My name is Katerina. I am co-founder and CEO of Adiva, uh, a platform where companies and uh, tech talent from across the world connect. Happy to be here today. I'm looking forward to discussing some unconventional ways of attracting talent and uh, navigating through all of the uncertainty in the market. Thank you. Ferry? Uh, hi everyone. My name is Ferenc or Ferry. Um, I'm leading a small recruitment team here in SaaS Group, hiring for all of our 18 portfolio companies. Um, I'm basically a recruiter or a lead recruiter. I started my career in 2010, primarily hiring for tech roles, but I will dove deeper into like all tech roles here at SaaS Group as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, like I said, it's great to see you here, guys. I think this topic has been hot 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 like throughout the year and it's just you know it's amazing to to see how how you guys survive uh in this super competitive market so yeah the first question is uh, exactly about that so how can companies effectively attract top talent in highly competitive markets i mean sauce is definitely one of them them uh so katarina do you want to take this one first Sure. Um, so for us, when we founded Adiva back in 2015, uh, we started working with um, markets that are not as saturated. And uh, we were remote since uh, 2017, so um, much before the pandemic. It was uh, a way for us to uh, focus on markets that are not um, like untapped talent, basically, people that don't have as many opportunities uh, as once in the global tech centers. And right now we see many, many companies that um, were first forced to go remote. Uh, a lot of them kept that as their strategy for uh, working with some of the best talent out there. Uh, I think this is one way to um, kind of bridge that gap and um, expand the talent pool with talent across the world um, when you are not competing with you know facebook or google or top companies in your local markets it's much easier to attract the best and also uh, it's about connecting to the values of uh, the candidates that you are um, working with basically because there are a lot of people that uh, now value flexibility more than anything and um, value the mission of the company they want to align um, with uh, the vision and the values of the brand so these are things that uh, can be an advantage uh, for companies when they're uh, looking to open up you know talent pool that would otherwise be inaccessible to them so I would say just embracing the um, ability to work remotely with regardless of um, the location of the candidates and also focusing on uh, that culture fit and the values that the candidates bring, whether they're, you know, good fit for the company. Okay, wonderful. Ferry, uh, do you have something to add? Yeah, I would... Um... And that like the way companies can attract uh, and hire uh, top talent, I think it somewhat also depends on uh, what stage the company is at, um, how many people they want to hire exactly, and what's the growth stage or maturity yeah, of the recruitment function um, as well. But I've seen, of course, uh, smaller companies more in the inception or like the founding stage in the, in the early days. Uh, often they don't have recruiters. Usually I have seen 
companies reaching the size of like 25, 30 people maybe before they hire their first people person. Uh, so they're the competing for the talent is up to the founders and the hiring managers directly, more, way more up to them than to the uh, to the recruiters. And once they hire the recruiter in like later stages or, or, or a people person, it's not always a, a recruiter first, sometimes an HRBP or that kind of people or similar who, who deals with recruitment as well. Uh, that's when like more initiative and process can be um, can be put into place, and when this person can take off some some workload from the from the managers. Often, if the volume of hiring is uh, is uh, increasing, that's the time when somewhat more investment goes into into uh, recruitment. And uh, yes, one way of competing for top talent here also is to start utilizing maybe employer branding, um, defining it better and better, like what the unique differentiator of the company, how they can attract uh, people, and then how to how to how to represent it during uh, a selection uh, process. Um, Another thing that I would say also when it comes to competing for uh, talent on the hiring manager side that it's uh, like hiring managers and founders, uh, of course, very often have very strong belief in, in their companies, but uh, they shouldn't take it granted that uh, that uh, top talent will want to work for them also. So they should be always ready to pitch uh, um, and if needed, book additional rounds for people, be more convincing and not only the founders, but like anybody else who, who interviews these people throughout the process. So it's one thing to know how cool is your company, but also like you should be ready to pitch it and don't automatically assume that other people will believe the same by default. Right, absolutely. Uh, thank you. And I just want to uh, mention that we're live. So uh, feel free to just uh, message me directly with a question or just drop a question below. Uh, but I have a question, <laughs> if I may uh, ask. And uh, I actually did a post about that uh, a couple of days ago. It's something that I read uh, in, in this book. I think it's called Entrepreneurial Marketing uh, by Philip Kotler. And it was, uh, yeah, it was about, you know, every company now talks about, you know, we want visionaries, we want someone talented, we want, you know, it's a talent Cool, right? So we want talented people, we want uh, someone who takes initiatives, we want someone who can drive the company forward. And I thought, yeah, that, that's like, that's amazing. But I also remembered a quote uh, that was from a totally different industry. Um, it was about restaurant industry, where a chef said, you know, I would rather um, hire a lot of like, really junior positions, because I can tell those people what to do. And sometimes it just need something to be done. Like, a, because when you have only visionaries on your team, it's also a big problem for the leadership. So like, you have to really have a strong leader to manage all those, you know, visionaries and super talented people who may have a very different idea of where this business could be going. So uh, what do you think about that? Like, is it becoming potentially a little bit toxic and like, hey, we just want, you know, someone who's super, um, you know, talented and, and uh, vision driven and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, Katerina, what do you think? I, I can agree. Uh, I think when talking about diversity in teams, it's not only about, you know, gender diversity or being inclusive and everything. Uh, there is a lot of uh, benefit for the company uh, from hiring diverse talent. And this doesn't only mean, um, you know, diversity is a box we're used to ticking uh, nowadays. It's more about um, having different profiles and different backgrounds uh, of people on the team because everyone can uh, bring in a uh, different perspective to whatever they're working on. So I completely agree. We do need uh, super talented people and um, experts in their field, but we also need uh, the juniors. We need the mid-level people in between and um, you know, a variety of backgrounds as well within the same team so that everyone can contribute uh, what, what they can best uh, to the team and to the product. Yeah, thank you. Ferry, what do you think? Um, similar also, I agree on the diversity of skills is what we want to build and not everybody has to be visionary. There are so many ideas and directions and uh, uh, future vision um, that we achieve coming from different people Then I think it might be hard to align uh, these people uh, or align on the vision. And if there are uh, 
so many visionaries in the team who will execute uh, in the end and make stuff uh, happen. Yes, we need we need we need often like less visionary people, or also are just happy to happy to execute, uh, get stuff done, uh, make things happen. Um, also, um, I, I had the chance uh, to experience it firsthand. Also, I used to have my own business with a co-founder as well, who was more on the visionary side, and less on the visionary side, more of about the implementation, execution, uh, delivery. Um, and I think it was an ideal combination. Uh, as well to to um, to have so it's it's great to have vision uh less practical if there's too many and they are and they are misaligned that might lead to like uh, too much uh, more than necessary ability i think right okay well thank you uh okay so the next question since you know we we uh touched upon um remote a little bit and everyone wants to be remote first now and South Group is a remote first company. So with the increase in remote work, what are the key challenges there uh, in hiring remote employees and how they can be addressed? Um, Ferry, do you want to go first now? Um, regarding remote challenges in, in, in uh, like addressing challenges in remote hiring. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's like, I would say one one thing to clarify that there are several ways of building remote uh, or like hiring remotely. Uh, one thing to one thing they agree on is is it a hybrid setup and we allow people to work remotely uh, as well, or is it a fully remote, completely distributed uh, company? Because they are they are not the same. It might be that some companies allow remote hiring, but uh, for some employees, but while the others are in the office. The ones that are remote might feel excluded, uh, I think, and it could leave some uh, misalignment uh, uh, also, and it's not the same employee uh, experience. So important to agree on, like, okay, if uh, if the team is split uh, between hybrid and, and remote, then how do we handle um, handle it? I think it's potentially more ideal if if uh, if, uh, if everybody is remote, and if, if if the team is remote and we decided, okay, do we build completely remote teams? Then are we set up for async work also, or do we kind of like um, uh, focus on certain time zones, or at least to some uh, to, to stay close to each other in terms of time and, and make sure that uh, that there is a certain overlap between um, working hours as well, or in case there's not, then are the others ready to? Um, adjust. So I think there are these basic agreements and decisions that needs to um, needs to happen, um, and then um, other challenges are that like recruitment and hiring and certain talent acquisition strategies can't really be uh, localized. It's like it's uh, often easier to focus on one country deeper than like twenty different countries. Um, it's much difficult to build the brand a reputation, attract talent um, as well if you distribute your attention to many other countries. But of course, it comes with the positive side of that uh, you have a much wider access to um, to different uh, talent as well. But they might not know you. Let's say if you are a German founded company, you might be known in Germany. But if you want to hire from Poland or Spain, they might not know you. And then you need to put more effort into maybe promotion or like pitching your company. Um, Another challenge might be, I think, is like compliance and like how to hire people exactly. What type of contracts uh, do you offer exactly? Do you hire people on your own payroll? Do you set up an entity or do you use different like third party tools like remote.com, uh, uh, to, to, um, to name a few? Uh, and then other challenges also like, of course, how to manage remote culture, how to build connections, how to create a sense of unity uh, as well and belonging when everybody is, uh, is remote and there are no office banter water cool conversations uh, there need to be ways of like how to how to how to nurture and maintain the culture in a remote setup also also these these three would be the first biggest challenges that that would come to mind first yeah katarina um do you do you think there are more what is the what is the most challenging for you in a diva uh Compliance, I would say. Lately, the line is blurred between, you know, what is considered uh, like behavior that can be done in a remote setting versus, uh, you know, uh, crossing the line. There are people that uh, decide to do multiple jobs at once, for example, and it's much more difficult to understand whether they are employed or not because they are working as independent contractors. So um, there are challenges around that when you... Uh, verify the background, uh, the history of 
the candidate, but also like what are they, do they doing right now? Are they fully dedicated to this project or doing something else in the um, in additionally at the same time? So this and it, it has become even a popular movement for people to um, kind of promote uh, doing two full time jobs at once. And um, it is one of the biggest challenges that companies will need to deal with as we move forward, because it. Uh, it is becoming uh, more and more um, present in the in the industry. Uh, we also see issues with identity, for example, people are faking their identity when applying to jobs and um, you need to do your diligence uh, upfront to ensure that you're dealing with uh, the the right person. As um, Ferry mentioned, compliance and type of contracts, um, again, working with uh, global markets, it is uh, a challenge. What? How do you approach it? Um, you need to be compliant with, with all local regulations. Luckily, there are a lot of companies like Deal, for example, that are um, helping with this. So you could um, kind of rely your whole operations on um, companies that are focused on solving this problem, but um, still it is something that will become more prevalent for companies and we'll all need to, to solve for it. Um, aside from that, everything that Ferry mentioned is valid, like um, employer branding across countries and um, how do you attract people when you don't know the market. All of those things are, are challenges, but they're well worth it uh, when you consider the uh, market potential and uh, you know you, you have much larger talent pool potentially uh, reduced costs so uh, that is something that is worth investing regardless oh wow you really surprised me with the identity thing i would like, <laughs> how do you how do you even do that like um but, it's, okay. it's super weird all right, I want to. I want some examples. Let's talk about this <laughs> of the right. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> but okay, uh, so uh, thanks so much for your answers. Uh, but the next question is, what are the most effective ways to reduce time to hire without compromising the quality of candidates? Like, for example, like when I talk to founders on the podcast, a lot of them say. Oh, like we, we hire when it really hurts, like, because like we try to save on costs and, uh, when it hurts, you kind of, you want to hire fast. So, uh, how to do that without, you know, um, without, um, losing the best candidate and really finding the person that's aligned with your culture and your vision. Katrina, what do you think? Uh, well, for us at Adiva, but we are kind of hiring at scale, um, so it, it might not be as relevant to any company out there. Um, we have a very strong referral program, which has helped us a lot uh, when it comes to hiring people fast. And um, our focus is on building a community uh, within our network. So um, we have people in many locations across the world, and we also try to uh, kind of foster this sense of community on local level, regardless of uh, where people are located. So we have local um, events or meetups, networking for people um, to to have the sense of belonging. Um, and we encourage everyone to invite their friends uh, to join us. So for that, we have a referral program that kind of rewards people that uh, invite their friends. Um, and also it's um, compelling because you, know, you would help someone get a job that they like. Uh, it's remote, it's under their own uh, terms. So uh, it has helped us a lot to expand over the years. Okay, very. We, we also have a referral program. <laughs> yes, yes. It unfortunately works quite well uh, also. Right. Yes, what other yes. tricks do we have? Yeah, um, when it comes to um, like hiring when it hurts, of course, it's always too late. I think it's important to like try to forecast a little bit. And I, I know it's not always easy, especially in like in turbulent phases to plan ahead. But it's also uh, important to understand that yes, once you realize that, okay, I need to hire, you open a job, you start screening applications, you define the process, you run the process, 
you make an offer. This all might take maybe like a month if you're lucky or two uh, if you need um, a bit more time. Uh, then you need to count with the notice period of the person and like also onboarding most candidates uh, or like most hires obviously are not productive on day one. So there is a certain like a couple of weeks or months till the person becomes uh, um, productive. So it might take actually like when it already hurts, it could be that it's still three to five months till you can address that problem. Uh, and then it will start hurting less. So try to plan ahead a little bit more, I think, and forecast, okay, this might hurt later. It's better if we start hiring now. Um, and then um, um, in order to, uh, to hire high quality candidates and not to compromise on the quality, uh, I would say it's important to like really define when you start hiring, like how to, who, who is the person exactly that you, um, that you need and for, for, for proper quality check, of course, we need to run a proper process, uh, uh, ideally a couple of rounds of interviews, maybe take some work samples or take on tasks for some live exercises or workshopping together or like simulate an environment, like a work environment. But I, I would say that not to compromise, in order not to compromise on the quality, you should not compromise on the, on the process. So have the process uh, established um, as well, based on the person or the type of profile and skill set that you are looking for figure out the process beforehand, ideally not on the fly when you already have candidates in the process and you had a good interview, like, okay, what's next? Um, but like establish the process uh, beforehand and then just try to smoothly run the process uh, because then it will also, uh, it can bloat, uh, like add time to hire if you are figuring out steps or like coming up with the stages while you already have people interviewing you. Um, and, and another thing, like I think to reduce time to hire that uh, it's again, a little bit of forecasting and planning that hiring takes time. Uh, of course, us as recruiters, we are very busy if we did. And often, sometimes what I see that hiring managers tend to be less busy with hiring when they should be. So they should plan that like at least a couple of hours, if they have an open position, yes, you need to dedicate time to check CVs, talk to the recruiter, interviews, write feedback um, as well, and make sure that we can get back to a candidate um, on time. If you had an interview, then like try to get back to the person in like a day or two, uh, so we can run the process uh, faster and move forward, especially if you have uh, if you have candidates and applicants that you already feel strongly about after the first call. Uh, in order to stay competitive uh, and reduce time to hire, it's important like not to give time for the competition to to, to grab um, the talent uh, from you. Once again, do not assume uh, that that strong talent will want to work at your company. You still need to fight for that, pitch it, and and like really shine throughout the process to uh, to convince them through that as well that uh, we we really want them. Okay, that's that's very good. Uh, well, I, I just made a post about um, um, original questions for. <laughs> For the podcast and we've got one <laughs> so you know buckle up guys uh, who defines who's the top talent do only silver spoon candidates deserve relevant positions and can a team be efficient if only lionel messi's um it's if it's only made of lionel messi's i guess we addressed that a little bit before mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what do you think about that question i think it's brilliant um fairy do you just want to go on yeah. Um, one second, I think it's like a combination of different skills that we want to build in a team. And I don't talk only about like maybe technical or hard skills as well, but what, what's the role of each and every person within the team? Yes, there might be idea generators. Uh, other people are maybe better at planning or executing, while others maybe pay attention to the, uh, uh, to the details and like uh, proofread or do the final round of QA on the, on something before it goes live so not everybody have to be i think like super duper top talent rock stars um, um, as well um it's rather a combination of skills that we that we are uh that, that we want to build in a team so that different team members can complement each other properly yeah absolutely katarina yeah i agree and it always depends on the company what a top talent is considered to be right because what's top for us at adiva doesn't mean uh it would be top for you guys at uh, SaaS because uh, for example uh, we work with companies that need to scale fast and when they need to scale fast they're looking for 
experts in their field, uh, able to start right away, uh, people who are self-driven and, uh, you know, have this consulting approach uh, where they can uh, contribute since day one. And that is what we assess um, when someone applies to, to join at Adiva. So um, unfortunately for us, we don't have a setup where we can work uh, well with junior engineers, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, top talent is only the expert level talent that we work with. Um, on your side, uh, I guess you have various criteria depending on the position that you are hiring for. And again, maybe top talent is kind of a um, misleading term because, um, you know, we mentioned uh, at the beginning people that are super talented or visionary and um, silver spoon fed, whatever. I don't think uh, talent as such is only what, what's needed for someone to, to be successful. I think that dedication and ability to communicate within the team and, um, you know, willingness to, to learn constantly and uh, move forward, uh, to me, these are much uh, bigger qualities that, than talent uh, on its own. If I would... I'd like to add one more thought. I think it also depends on the stage of the company. I think a company in early stages will, like, they might consider top talent the type of person who's uh, happy and productive in a more unstructured, unpredictable environment, maybe more of a hustler or cowboy type of person who can move fast and break things and, like, learn fast, uh, speak all. Um, and maybe, like, in one, two, three years, as the company grows, top talent might be a person who's more comfortable in maybe operating with a bit more structure or actually building that structure and processes also. So it's also interesting, I think, how, how, how the definition of top talent or somebody that we would consider a top performer in the environment um, depends on, actually, as the company evolves also. A certain managerial attitude might be completely fine uh, in the beginning, uh, and maybe not a fit a couple of years later. And tomorrow you see my picture changing on LinkedIn to the one in a cowboy head. <laughs> 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 but, uh, okay, thank you so much for your answers. I think it was a great question um, because, yeah, uh, Katrina, like you said, sometimes you think top talent and you just, like, instantly go, like, freeze. Am I a top talent? Like, where am I on the top? Uh, but uh, while you were talking, I thought about the previous question um, when we were um, when you were saying about um, hiring slow and like the fact that you know founders often only get a people person when it's more than twenty five people on the team already. And like, tell me if it's maybe not a relevant question uh, for you guys, but before you get to twenty five, right? You you have to hire them. Um, and how, as a founder, especially as a solo founder, uh, do you go about it? Like, how do you hire for early stage of a startup? And like, maybe not that early, right? Maybe you're like four people and you've been growing your company successfully to, I don't know, like three, five million ARR. This is very successful, I think, in, in our eyes in SaaS Group, for example. Um, so how do you hire from there? You're still fairly early at the, you know, the eyes of the VCs. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice about that, Katrina? Uh, well, I would say, I think uh, it's a very common mistake because we've made it a lot um, to hire for some kind of generic uh, JD. Uh, for example, we would need to hire engineers and then uh, I would open a job description that would uh, state all of the things the internet thinks are important for uh, engineers and you go ahead and hire a person you interview them uh, they tick the boxes but then uh, they don't perform as well uh, within your particular context because the needs of the company are different than what uh, you had described in in the job requirements um, i think the the most important thing is to be aware of who you're hiring uh, for this particular position and what are the expectations that you have from this person? Because um, we have made a, the mistake too many times uh, not to have defined this well for ourselves uh, at first. Um, and then you just hire a person that seems very skilled or is an expert in the, in the field, but then uh, they don't uh, meet 
the requirements of the job or your expectations from them because you haven't communicated communicated them uh, properly uh, throughout the hiring process. Um, so I think that is one thing that uh, is important to uh, to have upfront. What are the um, kind of in scope activities, out of scope activities, expectations from this uh, role, uh, requirements that um, both hard skills, soft skills. What what do you expect from this person? And also um, the the approach this person has towards um, new things like uh, for example uh, we had several bad hires because we thought that we came to a point where uh, we would utilize an enterprise um, approach more uh, so that um, when we saw someone with uh, more corporate background and more experience in i don't know documenting or presenting things we thought maybe they would be able to level up things within the team um, but then uh, once they joined it turned out that that it is a problem to align on you know that startup culture and um, the the drive that you need from everyone in the team and how you need uh, them to contribute to the growth of the company and everything. So I think that is the second um, big mistake we, we made as founders when hiring for our core team, basically uh, the, the culture fit and kind of miss expectations of where we are as a company and what is this corporate uh, style that, that we need at the moment. Okay, super interesting, Fury. What do you think? Um, I think in in early stages, when your product or company has no reputation, it's yes, it's difficult to attract uh, candidates because they don't know you. Maybe the job ad, the brand, or the logo doesn't say anything to a potential uh, job uh, job applicant. Uh, however. So it's difficult to get credit, but I think in these cases, what has credit is the people that you already have. So I would utilize network and referrals um, in that case. Um, your company might be six months old, but people that you work with, maybe they have 10 years of experience and already work with other people. And so, so they have credit. Uh, if my friend would approach me um, with, uh, with, with a company that I never heard about, but I trust that friend, then that company immediately has some credit, right? Actually, this is how I got into SARS code from me. So to be honest, um, and, uh, and, uh, so like, yes, utilize the network, poach ex colleagues, um, look around, ask for referrals. You may not know somebody, but somebody, you know, might know somebody. Um, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's a very cost efficient and quite rapid way to, 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 to go about it. It has its limits. Of course, after a while you will exhaust uh, the network and then you need to think of something else, but I've seen that it works quite well in the beginning. And another thing, I think that it's it's one thing to attract them, but it's also important, like who is exactly the type of person we are attracting at the beginning? Because in early days, the people that you are hiring now will be your hiring managers next year, or maybe even earlier. So are they able to promote the company, represent the company? When you hire them, do they have belief uh, um, in the company? Like, are they going to stay like, you know, two, three, four more years, um, maybe? And they are also going to be the, the founding members or the pillars of culture of the of the early days. Uh, and they will be the ones that affect the rest of the people and will shape and the culture will evolve with them. A bad hire in, in, in this phase, um, toxic hire potentially can cause quite a bit of uh, damage. So I think it's more important still to hire right in the beginning and not to compromise them to hire fast. Hire fast is also important, but it can become quite costly after. Yeah, right. We had uh, quite a few podcasts where a uh, founder said we approached higher fast. Uh, well, we adopted, sorry, higher fast approach. And then we had to adopt a fire fast approach <laughs> because like it was, yeah, it was a mess. Uh, but uh, okay, we have a new question. What behaviors should I adopt as a founder? when working with a recruiter. I think that's also a really good one. Like how do you, if you may maybe don't know yourself, like what your culture is or what you're building, you're, you're still early, right? You're building a product, not so much a company. How do you work with um, a recruiter? How do you explain? Like, what do you need? Who do you need? Um, Ferry, let's, let's just continue with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So when I work and worked with founders, usually the type of it's it's maybe it's not a behavior that the founder should adopt, but more like how to how to treat or how to work with the recruiter, how to establish a partnership. So I really like when I'm treated as a recruiter, like um, as a as an extension of the of, of the business, uh, extension of, of of that founder, because the founder will trust me to represent their brand and pitch it uh, to candidates um, and, and and sell uh, the company in the first round and gain enough engagement from the applicants that okay this this person will commit four to eight hours to a selection process let's say if I count everything with preparation and take home tasks maybe or like cases interview rounds, uh, considering an offer. In order to do that, uh, I, uh, me as a recruiter would like to really understand the business, understand the product, the problems uh, also. I don't want to just get like a set of requirements, like, look, I need X years of experience in this, and like these are the tech buzzwords that the person um, should know. Uh, I don't only just want to check boxes, um, but uh, but I really want to understand the business, the, the, the culture also, the product. Okay, the company looks like now, but how the company is, it's, like how, how do you plan that it's going to look like maybe a year from now? Um, and, uh, and, and have some type of vision for the position that we are hiring for, meaning that maybe the role looks like now, but if you want to hire achiever type of people high performers they will want to achieve and they will want to perform so like what are the chances and learning opportunities and impact and difference that the position will offer for them to to make the difference so like a founder should formulate this like how how what's going to make the position attractive for the person for the new hire for the next one or two years what's the growth path and then and then explain it to the recruiter also, if I understand the business much better, I will not only match for a set of buzzwords, but like actually for culture, for for uh, for mentality, for attitude, also. Okay, thank you, Katrina. Um, I completely agree. For us at Adiva, it's always we aim to have very high success when it comes to introdu introduction to hire uh, for uh, candidates for given positions, and it's important for us to be partners uh, with the client. So, um, as Harry said, like discussing what are the things that are important for them, understanding the needs of uh, the company right now and uh, mid to long term uh, from now. Um, also, very uh, be transparent about anything that happens every step of the process. Like if someone fails an interview or fails uh, an assignment, uh, be open about the criteria and things that uh, they need to uh, consider to to become better uh, at um, to to pass uh, the process uh, better uh, because this is the getting feedback like this uh, for mm -hmm. any future candidates would actually make it much easier to uh, have people that are better suited and um, better fit basically for the position so communication is key i would say uh, being transparent throughout the process and um, treat the person as a partner in it okay yeah, thank you. Well, uh, you know, since so you started mentioning, you know, the skills that you're looking for or the founder could be looking for. And I feel like we, we've covered a bit like of the um, recruiter side in this in this discussion. I want to throw in a question for um, the job seekers, because I think some are listening to us right now or will uh, when it comes to uh, to the podcast. So um, how do you guys choose uh choose candidates right what are you looking for in the cvs is it true that you have like four and a half seconds to go through a cv when you're hiring and like what is actually happening on the market like what do you see is there like complete desperation or is it getting better um so like yeah what's your opinion on that uh katarina let's let's continue with you uh, in terms of evaluating the CV and the time, Fairy can answer much better because I'm not that hands-on involved in that part. Um, but uh, when it comes to the market uh, at Adiva, we, we have seen that things are picking up. So uh, right now we have a lot of uh, increased demand uh, for a variety of positions um, and positions globally. So um, even though there are still companies that uh, are 
doing massive layoffs and uh, things are not as good on, in that regard. Um, a lot of people opened up, a lot of companies opened up for uh, remote positions and um, there are increased opportunities for people regardless of where they are located. So I think this kind of compensates uh, for, uh, for the layoffs part. And we have seen, uh, we've had interactions with people that have been recently laid off, but then in just a couple of days managed to find a new position and uh, continue um, on the market. So I think it's, it's good um, in that regard. When it comes to evaluating people, um, as I mentioned so on our side, we are working with uh, senior level talent. So uh, past experience in the industry is uh, important. Um, it, it, it's the primary factor for uh, the pre-screen. And then um, based on that, we continue the process with um, communication skills, consultancy skills, which is, again, very important for us because people need to be able to uh, get up to speed um, fast and uh, start working directly with the client. Um, so, yeah, that, that is the, the initial phase at the demo. Okay, thank you. Barry, you're blurry, but we can hear I'm you. I'm getting blurry. Yes, somehow my <laughs> camera is out of focus. I don't know how to refocus it. I try turning it on and off. Um, yeah, let me, anyway, I will not play around with this very about it. Uh, no, I'll try to, I'll try to fix it later when I don't have to answer. So I think, uh, Yes, I yes, time is often limited to, uh, to review CVs. I, I would say that it really depends on how much time I spend on, on a CV. I, I can make a judgment in five to 10 seconds also, because usually when I, uh, what I asked or what I mentioned earlier as well, that when I work with a hiring manager, I also want like clarity about like, okay, what, who, who is the person exactly or the type of skill set that we are um, looking for. Usually there are three or four absolute hard requirements in the role. And I don't advise for more. But there should be a few absolute skills uh, that 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 are necessary in order to perform successfully in the role. Uh, it's also necessary for the candidate to have it, of course, to set the person up to success early on. Um, if these three or four things, I, I, I can scan it in seconds also often. Maybe it, it could be like a level of experience, maybe a title or a similar title, certain experience in a domain or with the technology, difference between is it like a B2B type of person, a B2C type of person, if it's like maybe a product. Um, and if I screen CVs that I, I, I want to be able to identify this as quickly as possible. So like, I'm not a fan of long CVs. I think even very seasoned, experienced professionals should be able to sum up their experience in one or two pages. I appreciate short CVs uh, also. Um, and if I found these three or four things in, in like 10 to 15 seconds, then I will dive deeper and spend more time to read about the details, achievements, uh, job role, career history, summary, even hobbies uh, also. Um, and if I, if, if I find it to be a good match, then of course, then I decide yes, uh, invite. And then it might take maybe then I, I spent three, four, five minutes with the CD also, if it's something that I, that I really like. I check out the blog, I check out the GitHub profile then, uh, and then I try to gather more evidence uh, about the person that, okay, do I really want to talk to this person? Because once I talk to this person, I will add 30 minutes. And I will also ask for 30 minutes uh, from this person. I think it's fair to respect each other's time. I also wouldn't want to invite somebody and waste their time um, as well, if it's not a match, of course. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's already uh, a little helpful to, to the job seekers because, you know, I hear a lot of beef towards like recruitment uh like oh it's horrible it's a horrible process people don't have uh, you know time to to read my cv the how am i ever going to get a job so anyway uh thanks for clarifying that and uh let's move on to to our next question and i think it's a it's a really interesting one um because you know AI has been uh, in the talks for a while now. So what role uh, does AI and automation play in, uh, in modern hiring process, if, if any? Uh, Katerina, Barry, you will have time to, to fix your camera. Yeah, <laughs> I have seen a lot of examples where AI is involved in the beginning of the process for interviewing even. Um, and I have my doubts uh, around that because um, 
I, I think the, the human connection is still important, uh, especially because, you know, people will invest time to uh, get to know more about your company and, um, you know, they want to hear from someone on the other side. They want to ask questions. Uh, they want to feel like someone else invested time as well in the process because it's not, it's not one way, uh, relation. This, this should be, um, it should be the start of a strong relationship. Uh, so in terms of, you know, using AI for the screening part and the interviewing, I know, um, it is picking up a lot lately. Uh, but I'm not sure maybe Ferry has, um, more insight and, uh, different opinion on it. Um, at Adiva, we are incorporating AI a lot in the, uh, screening process and, uh, the matching process. So when someone applies, uh, we have an automated part, um, an automated screening on, on the CV. So, uh, to reduce those, those four seconds, um, uh, we try to evaluate, the, the background of the person, uh, using AI and, uh, depending on what positions we deal with at the moment, um, match them to the, to the proper one accordingly. Uh, right now we are also working on some, uh, more extensive use of AI, uh, within our platform. Uh, for example, helping people to sort out their profile so that they can be, uh, they can present their, themselves better with, uh, clients depending on a position. Um, we have, uh, automated matching and suggesting people for, uh, when someone from a team from our team opens uh, a concrete position, they get suggestions uh, from our talent network uh, for people that might be good fit. So I think um, this type of use will be, will increase um, from now on because uh, it's, a lot of companies are using AI in that regard, and um, it is simplifying the process a lot, especially if you have too many applicants to deal with. So you need to uh, streamline that part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. I was just, I just had a, a podcast with the founder of um, an AI powered HR tool. And she said uh, they also match candidates with the, you know, with the skills and skills to uh, possible positions. And she said there are, over 3000 skills. And I was like, I like for the love of God, I cannot <laughs> name over a hundred. <laughs> How did you come up with <laughs> over 3000? But that's fascinating. I think that can be super personalized. Uh, Ferry, uh, what about yeah. us? Uh, the, do we use AI uh, at Task Group for HR purposes? Partially, yes, uh, but we still have room for improvement there. To be honest, I have uh, I've seen AI being presented, AI automation being presented in recruitment for like years. Um, also, there are various tools also, um, as Katarina mentioned, also to automate certain parts, uh, talent matching, automate sourcing uh, as well. Um, go through LinkedIn, maybe create profiles sometimes, or like have uh, do matching with a predefined uh, uh, database uh, of uh, of candidates. These solutions exist as well, and some of them can save time. I tried like four or five different tools in the last five years, but I would say that still um, not since GPT though. I have to say, and earlier I found that they are not not there yet. So when these tools started to come out, uh, some recruiters said that, yes, this will eventually replace us. It, it's far from that. Uh, I think it can save time, but not yet at the stage that can completely replace uh, the human touch. Very simple example. I think it's still people that hire people and not robots. I personally would not take a job offer from a robot if it's fully automated. Um, I think it's still a bit, uh, uh, this, this human touch and connection is, is, is obviously it still i think and and uh, most of the people or maybe all of the people are like uh, are like this i think and when it comes to like more practical usage of ai at a uh, at SaaS group uh, i am um, we of course use chat gpt for uh, for content for sourcing for job ads for generating search strings uh, as well and we make a job description more attractive uh also define processes maybe define competencies we come up with certain playbooks some pitch maybe so like yes the texting uh, uh, candidate communication, messaging, like these parts, uh, AI can save a lot of time, but still needs to be human checked, 
software also, not only in talent acquisition, but like in many other areas. Uh, as well. I think even marketers proofread what the AI uh, generated, of course. Um, but I think really the real game changer is that we are about to implement also like explore more is what Katarina mentioned also. I think is the CV screening and filtering and matching is where it can really, really save a lot of time and like maybe automate short creation based on a predefined set of skills as well, or location or level of experience. So Katrin, I will approach you after if you if you don't mind about this specific topic as well. <laughs> sure. so um, and when it comes to automations, it highly depends on your applicant tracking system or ATS what you are using. That what is the level of automation that it uh, allows in terms of scheduling, candidate communication. Um, well, for example, we use Greenhouse, which is, I think, a great tool, but automation is not uh, among its strengths. I think uh, it can have a few automation triggers, but it's not too advanced. I think it's definitely where our app and tracking system would be to improve. I've seen better ones. Uh, I used, to, for example, Tim Taylor before, which uh, from an automation perspective, much, much, uh, much better, while in some other perspective, it's less, uh, less advanced also. And there are other tools that do it better too. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your answers. I will obviously cut out the part where you say we use ChatGPT for content. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Everything else will make it there. Uh, all right, um, I think we have still so many questions left, but uh, because we're short on time, uh, I'll just throw in the last one. Uh, how do you envision the future of workforce structure with the rise of independent professionals like me? Um, Ferry, you want to go first? Yeah, so I would say that, yes, with uh, what I've noticed in recent years, that with this, I think it's yeah, COVID was one of the game changers um, in this, as remote work started to spread and became more common. Uh, often when companies wanted to like call people back to the office, I think like people got comfortable and realized that, yes, they can be productive uh, in their home office as well through remote work also. Of course, like there were remote workers before and like digital nomads uh, way before that, but I've seen the surge in, 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 in that after uh, COVID um, as well. It looks, uh, the market in that aspect looks completely different than it looked like four years ago. Um, I was surprised in the last couple of months, like six to 12 months, and when we want to hire uh, independent contractors, so like hire people remotely, what is the level of or the amount of conversation we don't need to have about like what does it mean to freelance and do your own invoice like we don't have to educate people anymore i think or it's not way not as common as it used to be um, who want to work remotely because they saw that yes if i want to work remotely and maintain a bigger part of my independence and freedom and how i work with my time i see that these people they accepted that yes that it means I contract, I look after my taxes, I chase the clients. If I have to, I, I, I stay compliant and I make sure that I have a steady flow of projects. I maybe do my bookkeeping or hire an accountant. So they, I've seen that people are, are way more willing to give up this employee type of approach in order to trade it for more independence and freedom and remote work. So I see that this is spreading. I think the, the regulations and the legal frameworks don't follow it in this uh, pace. Uh, there are there are several countries that are are, are becoming more like remote and and uh, and contractor friendly and issue like digital nomad visas or have like e-residency programs as well, um, which is a which is a which is a very interesting trend um, I think. But other countries are still hesitant to uh, to adopt or or, or comfort these these uh, these uh, these. Uh, this change. Uh, so I've seen, I, I've, I've definitely seen a shift uh, also that with remote work, it's, it, it kind of brings the, this, this, uh, this spread of um, independent contractors, more entrepreneurial spirit also, I think, and people are willing to, willing to go down that path. Um, and for those that don't, uh, I mean, I don't want to mention again those tools that you mentioned before, but there are alternatives for them as well. Uh, but I see that, yes, uh, one of the big positive impact of of uh, of COVID, apart from of course so many like that, yes, remote work is is uh, is uh, is spreading now um, as well. Yeah, I I totally welcome this by the way. Like I, I was remote before COVID, and I like it, and I'm happy to happy to see more and more people with this mentality. Also. Perfect. All right, Katrina, what do you think? Uh, I agree, and I think that with all of the massive layoffs and everything, people are kind of um relying less on the stability of regular employment because 
nothing is stable nowadays and uh, the shift towards independent work and uh, you know having control over my time and uh, the working style and everything uh, it is becoming it, it, it is moving the the industry and I expect that it will continue to um, you know to to grow in that uh, direction and the countries will need to um, we need to follow suit with the regulations and everything. So that would, um, I expect that it would become a massive problem if it's not addressed. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's easier. I mean, as as a digital nomad, I mean, ugh. <laughs> dealing with, <laughs> with the regulations in different countries is hard. But um, yeah. yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad SAS Group makes it a little bit easier for me. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys so much for this conversation. So this will make it into an additional bonus episode of Saz and Bound, of course. So everyone else will be um, able to to listen to you. Thank you so much for your insights. I think you did a tremendous job. And thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, I think you're empowering so many people to to find their, their place and uh, their fit. So yeah, and uh, happy to do it again anytime. Same, same, same. Thank you so much for the invite. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. And take care.